got all our commissioners here. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the June meeting of the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, here in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone that's here. Uh, I haven't received a guest list, but uh, I, I would like to introduce Warren Googe, who's the uh, mayor of Oak Ridge. Warren, would you come forward and uh, let us see. I know you're here. There you are. Warren is a fine attorney from Knoxville. Yeah. I guess from Oak Ridge, but practices in Knoxville, so. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, members, we're glad to have you all uh, here in Oak Ridge uh, this weekend for your, for your meeting. Uh, obviously, the business that this commission does uh, is extremely important to uh, uh, the state of Tennessee. Uh, we appreciate your, your service uh, and everything you do to uh, uh, make this uh, great state uh, uh, safe and, and uh, for its citizens and its visitors uh, and uh, promote the sporting and use of our waterways and hunting and everything that you you regulate uh, uh, it's a busy day in Oak Ridge today most days are busy but this one is particularly busy uh, with with your meetings we have the uh, US cycling time trials going on down on the uh, Melton Lake Drive uh, and the women should be finishing their uh, uh, their their heats at this point and then the men will start this afternoon uh, we have uh, 80 cyclists here this weekend, and uh, eight are, are Olympic cyclists uh, and will be representing us uh, in Japan. So the time trials are today, uh, and then the races are tomorrow uh, and uh, Saturday. But again, we're glad to have you here. Uh, I hope you will come back. Uh, you know, my, my friend Steve Jones uh, uh, has been very instrumental in helping promote uh, the interests uh, of Oak Ridge and uh, uh, we appreciate everything he does uh, both for the state uh, and for our community here in Oak Ridge and uh, An Anderson County. Uh, and with that, I'm actually going to go back to work. Uh, I'm a health care lawyer and I'm getting ready for some rather substantial hearings uh, uh, next uh, Wednesday in Nashville when the Health Services and Development Agency uh, meets for the first time in person uh, in over a year. So again, it's a busy time. Thank you for your service and everything you do. And uh, uh, while you're here, if you, uh, if you need anything or we can make your stay uh, more enjoyable, uh, then Steve knows how to get in touch with me. I just hope all of you don't call at the same time. Have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We appreciate that and we appreciate being able to be here. At this point, Danette, would you please call the roll? Okay. Tommy Woods? Here. Angie Box? Here. Monty Ballou? Here. Stan Budd? Here. Wally Childress? Here. Bill Cox? Here. Chris Devaney? Here. Jimmy Granberry? Here. Steve Jones? Here. Ron McLaren? Here. Kent Woods? Here. Hank Wright? Here. Jim Ripley? Here. Chairman, we have a quorum. All right, thank you, Danette. Uh, at this point, I want to recognize Director uh, Wilson for the Executive Director's Report. Thank you, Chairman Ripley. Scoot over here. Uh, just a couple announcements. First of all, as you may recall, uh, a longtime employee of ours, David McKinney, retired back in October. He was the uh, chief of biodiversity and environmental services, and uh, he'd been a longtime employee of the state as well as TWA. So we were able to finally replace him. Uh, we had to hold off for a little while because of the freeze. But uh, Josh Campbell is our is our new chief of biodiversity. Josh, stand up. He's a uh, an agency employee. I'm a uh, twenty twenty. 18 years and uh, was the biodiversity biologist in region two. So we're excited about Josh coming on board. 
you'll get to see him a lot more in the future. And also, this is the uh, last meeting for Sheila Dalton, is the, the Region 4 business manager, and Sheila's been employed for 41 years, uh, all with TWA, so sad to see her go, but excited for her and her new, her new life, so uh, we're going we're gonna to miss her. And her replacement is Becky Hensley. Becky's sitting next to her. Becky's uh, been employed for a good while, too, so Becky, excited to see you there as well. Just a couple things uh, that I've been doing over the past month. I've made a presentation to Tim Green on June the 4th, and I was excited to see former director Gary Myers there in attendance. It was a Zoom meeting, but I still got to see him and talk to him on the, you know, through the Zoom for a few minutes, and it was, I was glad to see him still, still uh, healthy and looking pretty alert. And then tomorrow I'm going to give a presentation to the East Tennessee Economic Council in the morning, 7.30. Thank you, Steve, for arranging that. <laughs> uh, and as, as you all know, the hunting guide that we, uh, that we put out about this time of year is about to go to press. I think we uh, sent it to some folks, and I, I'm not sure the exact timeline on that, but it's going to be going out pretty soon, so hopefully we'll get it back about the middle of July or so. Um, just a quick mention of Buffalo Ridge. There's a lot of things going on there. We're starting to get ready to move some dirt there. And uh, I know some of the new commissioners haven't had a chance to go see it yet, and hopefully you will soon. But we're going to give an overview of this uh, either at the July uh, budget preview or maybe at the August meeting. We haven't decided yet, but just want to, some people may, some of the commissioners may uh, want to know what's up with that, and so I just want to give you a heads up. And then I also want to acknowledge that a, a huge partner in our fight against chronic wasting disease of this past spring, uh, we wrapped up the targeted removal program about a month ago. We had about 30 landowners that worked with us, so, uh, you know, as you know, targeted removal is a critical tool in, in a battle against uh, chronic wasting disease. We don't we want to reduce the deer density in those areas of the sparks and help try to spread it, uh, prevent the spreading of the disease. So uh, it's a partnership between landowners and TWA, and it's critical to the success of the program in managing chronic wasting disease. There were 100 deer removed in the four targeted spark areas. Uh, none of the 100 were CWD positive, by the way, which is good news. All the meat was donated to landowners and hunters for the hungry. So we just want to give a heartfelt thank to all the landowners in this program publicly. And I uh, won't mention their names, but just thank you all if you're out there listening. And I was able to, do, me and a few other folks last night were able to go out on the Oak Ridge Reservation. Thanks to the, our guide, who is Paul Shaw, a crew clerk at Norris, uh, gave us a tour of the synchronous firefly population that's out there. It's pretty impressive. It's not just the Smokies that has them. They've got a pretty good population too, but there's one here that uh, is real impressive to watch, watch those things. And here, Paul's an expert about them. He gave us a very informational tour about that. And so lastly, I want to introduce our, our new, another new employee, Michael May, retired. As you know, last month was his last meeting. Uh, we re replaced uh, Chris Richardson as the new deputy director of our business operations. So uh, most of y'all know Chris. He's been around for a while, and we're excited for him and his new role. And you're going to hear from Chris in just a few minutes. But that's all I got, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Director. Are there any announcements from commissioners? Anyone have anything they wish to say at this point? Steve? Uh, so Director Wilson mentioned that uh, he was – uh, addressing uh, the East Tennessee Economic Council in the morning at 7:30. This is, uh, you know, probably the premier uh, get to get weekly get together in East Tennessee. It's uh, it's all the contractors from the Department of Energy, the Fed uh, folks from the Department of Energy, and subcontractors. I mean, every pre-pandemic, every Friday morning uh, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, over 200 people would get together and. And it was a great networking opportunity to network with TVA and the folks at Y12, the lab, and UCOR. Um, and Bobby's given the first presentation since we're starting to come out of the pandemic and have in-person meetings. And I just wanted the rest of the commission to know that you are invited in the morning. Uh, the building is, you can almost see it from the parking lot. So um, uh, it would be a great opportunity to interact with those folks. So everybody on the commission's invited. Andy, did you? Oh. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> All right. At this point, I want to recognize Chris Richardson, our deputy director, um, to give us an update on communications. Thank you. thank you, Chairman Ripley, members of the commission, and thank you, Director Wilson, for the, the words. Excited to be in a new role. Excited to uh, take on some more responsibility internally with the agency and 
Uh, while I've been drinking out of a fire hose now for a couple of weeks, I'm swallowing as fast as I can and, and ready to hit the ground running. Uh, certainly one of the things that I want to focus on early um, and, and fast with, with, with my new role is, is improving the communications both internally and externally. This has been something that, that certainly uh, we've all been focused on, uh, but, but in my opinion just still have yet to quite hit the mark. Um, and there's been a lot of topics and a lot of discussion about different ways we can go. Uh, but one thing I wanted to put out there for discussion today, and I hope to come back to you in an August or September time frame with, with some finalizations of some, some improvements here, is, is the communication between the, the agency and the commission first and foremost. I think we have uh, ground to improve in that regard. And I think there's a few things that, that certainly I have in my mind that we can do better at, but also wanted to put this out there as a discussion topic for you both today to discuss, but also to, to also get back with me with your thoughts between now and that August, September timeframe when we hope to finalize some of these uh, new, new procedures. I think that there's a lot of news and events that go on in the agency that we don't quite uh, get to you in a timely fashion. We don't necessarily get you as much information as we could. And sometimes maybe we're giving you the wrong information. Um, so certainly if there are events in your area, if there are uh, things going on with the agency, whether they be fish stockings or fishing rodeos or uh, hunter education classes, those types of things, we'd like to develop a calendar uh, that you all have access to that will show you location, dates, times, things that you can come on and access if you want to find out what's going on. Um, there's also, I think, ways that we can improve how we communicate to you about our facilities. Um, we, have a, we have a lot of WMAs in this state. We have the Buffalo Ridge uh, Outreach Center that direct, Director Carter had just referenced. We have other shooting ranges and things that go on. And I think we need to provide some level, excuse me, did I say Director Carter? <laughs> Force a habit. My, my apologies, Director Wilson. Um, Not a good start, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the wrong foot can often be the right foot, Chairman Ripley. You taught me that. Uh, in any, any event, I think there's an opportunity for us to develop more of an executive style report, whether that be annually, quarterly, or otherwise, to tell you how we've utilized our facilities. This would also be a public facing document, both for your use and something that we can put out to show the value when we make improvements to a facility, how are those facilities being utilized to further the mission of the agency? Um, also, when it comes to the legislative session, I'm gonna maintain those responsibilities even in the new role in addition to uh, the other direct reports and supervision that I'll be providing. And I wanna do a better job of providing you all uh, with weekly updates at a minimum during the legislative session. Uh, so we'll be focused on that when we get back to January. Uh, there's also, I think, it, ways that we may want to look at as an agency of, of, in, of, of increasing the personnel on the communication side of the shop. Uh, we've certainly discussed the possibility of recruiting and hiring a public information officer um, and there, there are ongoing discussions there. Uh, certainly finding the right position, finding the position, reclassifying it, some of those are hurdles. But wanted to just get this, take this opportunity to get your all's thoughts on where the, where you feel communication is from the agency to the commission and also uh, look forward to hearing more thoughts going forward if they come to you between now and when we finalize some of these protocols. So with that, Mr. Chairman, that's a brief kind of overview of, of what I wanted to start as a discussion and, and let you all know that it's certainly going to be a focus and a priority of mine in, in the new role as deputy director and welcome any thoughts you all have in that regard. Well, we appreciate it. Appreciate that very much, Chris. Do any of the commissioners have a comment or question at this point? You know, one of the things that we discussed, uh, uh, Commissioner Jones had an informational meeting just to, to look at this issue, and there was some discussion of maybe a, an actual portal where we could access information, and that, that was an exciting idea, I thought. Uh, so keep us posted on that, if you will. Certainly do so, Chairman. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, at this point, I want to recognize Jimmy Granberry, the Chairman of the Wildlife Management Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I start, I'm uh, remiss to uh, thank uh, Commissioner Jones for his hospitality at his wonderful farm and meeting his dad and 
the beautiful setting. And so thank you, Steve, for your hospitality this morning. It was uh, fantastic. And I caught more fish than anybody, but don't, we don't need to talk about that. But anyway, also um, along the lines of uh, uh, Chris's comments, uh, our emails that we get from the state are great. And I encourage everybody to read Jennifer's email that was sent out earlier this week relative to the CWD incentive uh, program that uh, is a very exciting uh, adjustment to an already existing program and it's pretty self-explanatory so anyway thank you so at this time i'd like to call on uh, joe benedict you want, oh that's right dr bugler you're gonna go instead of joe thanks mr cranberry we had a slight change so i'm just going to give a little no i understand i okay. just was looking at the agenda and looked at your name first i thought joe was going to introduce you go ahead thank okay you. well thank you um my name is wally akins i'm uh, assistant chief for wildlife and forestry division and last month if you recall i gave a short presentation on our management actions that we've been doing and our restoration efforts for quail and today i've been uh, asked to give a uh, a um, short synopsis of current and planned additional efforts that we've got uh, planned for quail uh, to serve as introduction to dr bueller's presentation here in a few minutes so if my voice will hold up three or four minutes, I'll, I'll be able to get through this, but thank you. Um, as, and, and I have bullet points up here on the couple slides. The um, quail plan that we, we had approved late last year, we've, we've uh, just now getting into the implementation phase of that. We actually began implementation of certain aspects of this plan, though before it was final, finalized and approved, um, mainly to help us gather information and help us uh, make better decisions within the plan. Um, all this time leading up to this, our managers have been working on our habitat work on our WMAs and our focal WMAs to make enham enhancements and improvements. And also our private lands managers have been working uh, to deliver those habitat assistance programs to landowners inside those focal areas or uh, surrounding the, the WMAs focal areas. The quail research project we're going to hear about in a few minutes uh, it's just like the turkey project it's being conducted by the university of tennessee and it'll give us crucial information uh, on the bottlenecks of quail populations pending results of this um, this research we can focus our habitat work and other efforts uh, on specific habitat areas and the needs for quail during those crucial and stressful times of the year in particularly uh, also in the quail plant or the research project is, is, a, is a big part of the initial uh, stages of implementation for the quail plant itself. The small game survey we implemented last year for the first time since um, 2010 and before that it was in the 70s since we've had a small game survey. So. Um, get, this is the second year. The results of our second year of this survey will be out later this summer or very early fall. Uh, but this, with the survey, we're getting estimates of quail harvest, uh, numbers of quail hunters, and also hunter effort. Management plans for the quail focal areas are, we currently have uh, drafts for two of three of our uh, focal areas that are involved in the quail uh, research program. Uh, they're working on Wolf River. I think the, the uh, Dr. Craig Harper went down last week, so we'll get that first draft from him pretty soon. We'll further refine these, these plans once we get more information from the research uh, for, to, uh, and we gather more adequate data or University of Tennessee gathers adequate data to help us finalize those plans. The quail team that we have with the agencies are currently looking at other WMAs to identify areas for potential quail enhancement and restoration efforts. Emphasis will be placed mainly on those WMAs that we've, we've considered for various reasons in the past. Um, we'll look at these areas for specifics of work needed, manpower, and resources that we may uh, be deficient in. Um, or if we can't accomplish them with our existing manpower that we have and resources and re bring these recommendations forward to our directors and uh, members of the Wildlife and Forestry Division staff is, and certainly our WMA staff uh, before we finalize these recommendations. 
We've got a uh, switch here. Next slide. Yeah, we've got a quail blog. We've already made some improvements to our information on our website, but we hope to have a quail blog going live in, by this fall. We've added representation from our outreach and communications uh, division to the quail team so we can make these improvements more efficiently um, and put out regular information on quail management, restoration, and also quail hunting. It'll be a big part of that. We're in initial discussions of a meeting coming next spring. We're calling it the Quail Summit. Um, this will be a pretty big meeting and involve not just the agency, but a, uh, a lot of agency partners to kick off the new uh, quail restoration plan with emphasis. Uh, we're really early into thinking of this, but you know, when we get our plans laid out in the next few months, we can bring this uh, proposal for this event forward to our directors for consideration. Working Lands for Wildlife is a program, a Farm Bill program administered by the NRCS. Uh, Bob Whites are nationally identified as a species of priority through the NBCI as well as you know, state wildlife action plans. Uh, this program is producer focused. So um, it's to target conservation efforts to improve ag and forest productivity as, and also enhance wildlife and bobwhite quail habitat on the working landscape. And our private lands biologists are working closely, who work closely with NRCS, they are, are vital in administering this program. Uh, communications will be a huge um, and play a major, major role in, in the success of the Working Lands for Wildlife program. We want to work with all of our partners, but especially Farm Bureau Ag, and Ag Extension Agency and, and as well as others. But they're in, crucial to the promotion of this program and help us, um, not only us, but our partners get the word out about quail. Finally, we've got some budget requests coming up that we've prepared and will be submitted for our director's review. Uh, these requests will help us enable the implementation of strategies for quail restoration and also our components of the quail plan. Um, with that, if it's okay, I would like to introduce Dr. Bueller for his presentation on the research. Uh, this is one of, a first formal presentation of the quail uh, research project that just started really January of this year. So uh, Dr. Bueller is a professor at University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Um, I won't give away my age, but he was just getting there when I was getting out of UT. But he's certainly um, led the way, uh, been a, a great instructor to a lot of folks that work for the agency, and he's certainly a friend of TWRA. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Bueller. All right. Has anybody heard from Dr. Bueller? Okay, well, he must be running a little late. Uh, Joe Benedict, if you would. Oh, so I'm here. Okay. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Are you with us, Dr. Bueller? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I don't know if you can see me or hear me, but I am definitely here. Can you hear me? You're a tiny man. <laughs> I'm actually over seven feet in stature, but um, if you could put the slides up, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to give the commission an update on the quail project. Can you share the screen? Yeah, we have we have the uh, introductory slides as Tennessee Cooperative Northern Bob White Research. Is up, okay, and we see you. You're in the okay. corner of the screen. Yes. Okay, great. I'm I'm ready then. Um, well, ironically enough, you all are meeting in person, and I'm presenting virtually from northern Minnesota. And I was had some family responsibilities related to walleye fishing up here that uh, could not be avoided. So I decided to do this uh, presentation from the North Country. So, but I really appreciate the chance to talk about quail and, and the progress we've made on the quail project 
over the last um, five and a half months since we got started. Next slide, please. So the project, um, the overall goal of the project really is to provide the agency with the information and the, the support really needed to advance quail management on the focal areas. And so we're providing this, the scientific foundation for what the populations are doing, the habitats that are being used, and then Craig Harper is working with the managers to really develop a very focused and comprehensive management effort on these properties. And then we're going to evaluate that success over time. So it's really important that the project is tied very, very closely to the agency's efforts on quail. And the goal is to really advance quail management on the focal areas. Next slide. So we are working across the state on three focal areas, including Kiker Bottoms in Region 4, Bridgestone Firestone in Region 3, and Wolf River in Region 1, which is also the NBCI um, state focal area. And these areas represent a very broad range of conditions that we believe will be very useful for helping to inform management on other properties across the state. Next. So uh, to get the project going, you have to trap quail. And we use conventional baited funnel traps like they've been using for the last 50 years on quail research. Uh, and they have worked fairly well. But at Kiker Bottoms, we've also gone to an interception trap design. And that's what this slide shows, where you put up a chicken wire fence, uh, in some cases, 150 feet long. And then on each end, you put a funnel trap. And when quail walk across the landscape, they hit that chicken wire and they are dumb enough that they don't jump or fly over it. They just walk along it. They get to the end, they get to the funnel part and they go into the box. So um, interestingly enough at uh, Kiker, this approach was very effective this winter. And we caught entire coveys with a funnel trap at one time. Next. So once we uh, have birds in hand, then we radio tag them with conventional VHF radios. And this is a, um, a necklace sort of design. And the radios last six to eight months. Um, they're very effective. You can pick up a bird from at least a quarter mile away. So they're effective for meeting our objectives for monitoring the population. And I've got a couple of videos here that I'm, show I'm hoping will actually show the um, tagging and the release of a bird. This is one of my field assistants at Bridgestone, Paul Underwood. The nice thing about this is, as well as pulling the neck is see how it already fluffs the feathers over it pretty much oh, for yeah. you. So it's less time as well handling the bird. Really seems a fit, seems very straightforward. Really. It is, it's very straightforward once you understand and you get it. Once you figure out how tight tight is. Yeah. And then the other video, please. Hey guys, this is Paul Underwood. I'm out here today tracking and trapping quail with Dr. David Beeler. And we just so happen to have a re a recapture female that I called her the other day actually. Her band number is 202 and basically what we're doing this study for is to study their reproductive habits and where they go at different times of the year, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so like I said, she's an adult female and we're gonna go ahead and release her real quick. Okay. Well, the rest of the covey should be that way, so here we go. Okay, so we're monitoring these t radio tag birds then with um, standard uh, radio telemetry gear. The nice thing about quail is you can home on their signals and get within um, 20 to 30 meters of them without flushing them and get very good um, detailed locational information and associated habitat use. And then ultimately we also are monitoring survival. Are they live or dead on a daily basis? And, and their movements, home range, and reproduction. Uh, 
one of the goals is to have a good sample of hens marked as you go into the nesting season. And then once you have the radio, you can find the nest readily and that allows you to monitor reproduction. So pretty much standard um, tools for tracking these parameters. And then in terms of the population, we're going to be doing fall covey counts this fall uh, to estimate the number of coveys that are on each area and the relative size of each of those coveys. And that will give us a very good uh, index to the overall population size present at the beginning of the hunting season in October. Next. So in terms of progress to date, uh, of course, the commission approved the, the project in September of last fall, and Roger Applegate helped us get that contract in place in record time. And by December 1st, I had an account number. I hired a bunch of people. We got all the equipment together, and by January 4th, we were trapping. So that was actually really, really record time to be in the field um, in, in such short order. Uh, in terms of the trapping, uh, the trapping was very successful, although it required a lot of work. And we trapped 35 birds on Kiker Bottoms and 35 on Bridgestone, approximately even 50-50 uh, males and females. And we got about 40 birds on Wolf River. And so that trapping from January to April was basically very effective and we met our goals. Since then, we've been, well, during the whole time, we've been monitoring uh, survival. And the survival over winter actually looked very good uh, with over 75% crude survival during that period. As we went into April, it was interesting because when the coveys broke up uh, and the pairs started splitting off, uh, we started losing birds from mortality, especially from raptor mortality. So uh, the monitoring to date, the survival monitoring has really highlighted April is kind of a crunch period. And we need to think about that transition from winter covey habitat to um, summer nesting habitat and how birds transition between those two settings to, and to keep them alive at a better rate than we have been. And then of course, right now these birds are nesting and uh, we've got nests in all the areas and we're monitoring reproduction and that'll be ongoing all the way um, into August. Next slide. So a little bit about the habitat management planning that is one of our key objectives. Uh, we have already through Craig Harper's work with the managers documented the current conditions and he spent uh, several days on each area. And, and in fact, he spent 20 years working with Bill Smith at Kiker Bottoms and 14, the past 14 years working at Bridgestone on various projects. So he is very, very familiar with these areas. And he also spent um, a couple of days last week working with Brandon Gilbert at Wolf River. So we've documented the current conditions and then he and the managers have developed draft management strategies uh, for moving the properties forward. And these the management plans that we're working on will actually be the first uh, developed, organized quail focused management plans on each of these areas since they've been named uh, focal areas like five years ago. So we feel like we've really made some progress on this front. Next. So let me just take you through the each individual area. And I just kind of want to give you a 10,000 foot overview of what this management is going to look like. Of course, Kiker Bottoms is the smallest area and it's 576 acres, but a significant portion of it is in waterfowl management in the winter. Uh, this area has a lot of good early successional habitat. Uh, in part because of, or mainly because of Bill Smith's efforts and in part because of Craig's involvement with Bill over the years. Uh, but this is a very isolated area surrounded by a sea of fescue and human development. And so there's um, some challenges that, and limitations that have to be addressed for moving the plan forward. So the next slide shows you the overview of the area. And you can see that uh, the area outlined in yellow is Kiker, and it looks very, very different from the surrounding landscape. And most of that surrounding landscape is in fescue, and most of it is not quail habitat. So Bill has a unique challenge because he is an island surrounded by non-quail habitat in the surrounding landscape. 
But this is what the vision in the next slide looks like for what the area could be. And the thing that strikes you immediately is that it's a very, very um, complicated patchwork of habitats. And this is really what quail need. They operate at a fairly small patch size. And so when you start thinking about quail habitat, you have to be thinking about 10 acre patches rather than 100 acre fields. And so as this vision becomes implemented, we're really hoping that quail will respond positively. Let's look at the next slide for Bridgestone. So Bridgestone, um, the farm unit is slightly larger, a little over 700 acres. And this is an area that um, the, the underlying vegetation has changed, but the overall picture or the landscape that the farm unit is in still looks very similar to what it did when the agency first got the property. Um, it also is surrounded by a sea of forest, uh, a lot of pine forest and hardwoods, and most of that forest is not suitable for quail. So the challenge here is kind of like Kiker in that it's isolated, but there's some real opportunities here because forest management can be used as an important tool. The next slide shows you what that landscape looks like, and you can see the farm unit is large patches um, and surrounding forest. And then the next slide is the vision for the property that Aubrey Deck and, and Craig have worked on. And you can see that the farm unit itself would be broken into much smaller management units with much more diversity, much more edge. And then the big brown chunks in the uh, left-hand corner of the um, slide would show you forest management that is per currently being planned where they will be thinning and ultimately burning pine stands to provide an additional um, five to 600 acres of quail habitat in the future. And then finally, we go to um, Wolf River. And of course, Wolf River is the largest of the three areas. And it's the, it's the only area that was large enough to qualify as an MBCI uh, focal area at 1300 acres. But it also has its, um, its limitations in that the Wolf River bottoms to the north of the property uh, represents unusable space for quail. And to the south of the property, there's a lot of private land that has some potential, but it would probably take work with the private lands biologists down there to really advance some of that private lands into quail habitat in the future. So let's look at uh, the overview of that, that area and you can see Wolf River sitting in the middle, the Wolf River bottoms to the north. And this is actually just the quail focal area, part of the management area. The management area is much larger and includes a lot of the bottoms. But you can also see to the south of there all the private land that we would have to work with private land landowners to actually expand significantly the footprint of this uh, focal area. And then the vision for that, that Brandon Gilbert has worked on with Craig, shows the same idea. Um, quail need a patchwork of cover types in close juxtaposition with each other. And this vision, just in a snapshot, shows a lot of those characteristics uh, pretty clearly. So the last slide, I'll wrap up. Um, I think already we are seeing a lot of really good things moving forward with this project. Um, we've met our goals in terms of just capturing and tagging birds and, and tracking birds. When we started, we didn't know, you know what it was gonna take and how many birds we could even catch and how many birds were available to be caught. But each of the areas had six to eight coveys present in the winter time. Covey size was 10 to 15 birds per covey generally. And so uh, we had a reasonable baseline population to begin with. Um, and that has allowed us to document quail activity, movements, habitat use, survival and reproduction, the key population parameters we need to understand what's going on with the population. And then finally, we've also moved the management forward significantly in the last few months with Craig working with these managers. And the good news is all the managers are really excited about this and are on board, they're all in, and they're anxious to get out there and start to put management on the ground and to see what quail are going to do. 
So I think um, collectively, the commission, the agency, the university, and Quail Forever, you know, we all have made a big investment in this project. And it's based on this vision that quail are an important resource that have declined precipitously. But our goal is to bring it back, bring it back at some level so that we have this resource for future generations. And I think collectively, we are really shining the light on this quail restoration in Tennessee. And I can already say that um, the project is being successful. And I thank you for your investment in it and uh, giving us the opportunity to do this work that we think is so important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Buller. Uh, did uh, any of the commissioners have any questions for Wally or Dr. Bueller? Commissioner Cox? Uh, for either one. I think it's on. Is it on? Hear me now. Um, what, what are you doing different than what's been done at Wolf River or Kike or anywhere else for the last 20 years? Well, I think the key thing is when you look at the current conditions and you look at the vision of what these areas could look like, um, it's really bringing more intensive management to these areas at a, small, a finer scale than what has been done previously. And so, for example, at um, Bridgestone, they burn in 100-acre blocks um, on the 600 area 600 acre area well when you burn a 100 acre block and you have a covey of quail which we did in the middle of that block you've essentially moved removed all their winter habitat for that season and they have to move somewhere else well if you would reduce the, the scale of your management to say 25 acre blocks then you could burn and that quail covey would still adjust to where you burned in the winter but they would be within their, their home range. So I think a lot of it is intensity of management and scale of management that is different than what's traditionally been done in the past. All right, so in the, in, after the study, what, what is the, and I'm sorry, I wasn't here when this was started and funded, so everybody may know the answers but me, but what, what is the end game? What is the, when you get finished with your study what are you what is the result going to give us are you going to tell us this is how you want to do it if if you want quail on your property or uh, we're going to restore it to the quail to the landscape or what what exactly are we trying to accomplish well first of all we will understand why quail populations are as stressed as they are We'll also understand if you impl implement intensive management, this is what you could expect in terms of, res of a response. And so I think we will actually have a recipe for quail restoration that'll fit both on WMAs and on private lands. And we'll know what investment it's gonna take to be successful. So we're gonna have that recipe or blueprint for the future when the project is over. Are you doing predator control, ground nest predator control on any of the areas? Well, there is some low level trapping going on during the winter right now, uh, mammalian trapping on each of the areas. Uh, but, you know, that's one thing that we're gonna have to look at is, you know, what can we do without any predator control? Or do we need more targeted trapping later in the season, like in April, May, before they start nesting to actually be effective? So that's something that we're going to have to address. Well, yes. it just seems to me that, it, that that's got to be in the study on one or two of these areas to compare predator control versus no predator control. And also, it, it, and I know this is something that's hard to control, but avian predation is maybe the, uh, the the biggest problem and is there is there i mean wildlife agencies are spending millions of dollars on quail and the hawks are eating them so is there any 
chance that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife would would allow depredation as part of the study? Um, yeah, that I'm not sure about. I would say I would doubt it. Uh, that, you know, the thing is, it's even based on our first uh, winter spring of tracking, Cooper's hawks, you know, obviously are um, <laughs> regular predators on quail. And I don't think the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is going to give us a permit to even experimentally to remove Cooper's hawks. But, you know, we haven't addressed that issue. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Butts. Commissioner Butt has a question. Uh, Dr. Bueller. It's on. It just took a while to warm up. In your presentation, you mentioned about the increase in predation from raptors. Has there been any discussion with the Audubon Society as far as the movement of the migratory aspect of, of the raptors? Uh, I've been made aware of the fact that, that depending on uh, the severity of winters and uh, in a lot of our areas here in Tennessee, since we are kind of in the central location of, of how they migrate, then sometimes they migrate much farther south. Uh, that's something, an aspect you might look at in, in some of your predation uh, counts as far as uh, the number uh, of Cooper's hawks or, or other hawks, you know, blue tails or, or whatever. Uh, has, has anything like that been considered? Well, you know, um, we haven't, personally haven't talked to Audubon or any bird groups about um, dealing with raptor issues. But I think uh, the, the thing we're really looking at though is can we provide enough raptor proof cover to reduce the amount of predation that occurs, especially like what we saw this year in April, where um, you know Cooper's hawks were moving through and picking off uh, individual birds. So you know that that's really the right now the best option we've got is can we provide cover that is more raptor proof? And I guess my next follow up question is: Does the uh, telemetry limit the movement of the quail or their ability to? Uh, navigate in the cover uh, with those collars on? There's been quite a bit of research about that and there's been a fair amount of speculation. But, um, you know, generally the birds, you saw that bird fly off, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to put that video in there. The birds handle these collars very well in a very short period of time. And uh, our belief is that the radios do not impact their survival rates or their movements. Thank you. Chairman Ripley, you had a question? I do. Uh, thank you for being with us, Dr. Bueller. I hope the fishing's going well up there. And uh, I guess when we talk about declining quail populations, there have been a lot of reasons for the decline that I've heard, habitat loss, disease being one of them predation. My question is, when you lose birds, uh, when you have mortality, while this study is, is ongoing, are you able to tell, in most cases, what the cause of the mortality is? Are there necropsies done to see if there's a disease issue, that kind of thing? Well, we're not actually specifically looking at disease issues. Um, although we could with Dr. Gerholt in the vet school, just like on the turkey project, in most cases, the field sign is very evident as to what the cause of mortality is. Um, when hawks, at least down to the level of, you know, group, when when hawks kill uh, a quail, they usually pluck it, and you can tell by the field sign that it was a hawk. And uh, when mammalian predators take them, they usually carry the whole thing off. And so generally, you can at least get it down to was it killed by a hawk or killed by a, some mammalian predator? You know, whether it was a bobcat or it was a coyote or, you know, a fox, um, 
it's hard to tell at that level, but you can at least put it into group. And are you able at this point to say, okay, it's primarily avian predators versus uh, terrestrial predators or? Well, we haven't, you know, we haven't formally um, analyzed those data yet, but my impression just from regularly getting reports from the field crew is that um, there's quite a bit of avian predation occurred, especially in April. And what about nest predation? Is that so, yeah, being evaluated we'll be as well? Yeah, that and we'll, we're just getting into that stage right now to see. But you know, nest predators, um, you've got snakes, um, mammals, rarely birds, you know, hard, hardly anything like crows or something like that messing with a quail nest, but it's almost all mammalian or reptilian. And um, yeah, but we'll definitely be looking at that in terms of um, what the field sign looks like. Okay, thank you. Any other commissioners have any questions? Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am really pleased to see how the different stakeholders are working together and how far we've come so far. I appreciate the questions that uh, Commissioner Cox and Commissioner Butts asked about uh, predation because uh, that, that has to be part of your uh, habitat management program, particularly on these areas if we're going to use them for wild bird programs. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Jennifer sent out a video uh, to the commission that was, um, it was a Smithsonian biologist that was talking about, uh, bobwhite quail was one of the many birds that she was talking about that were disappearing from the landscape. Would it be possible, I mean, I'm tickled to death, the focus is on bobwhite quail, everybody knows how I feel about them, but there's a, you know, there's a, another gain here as we uh, work on habitat for bobwhite quail for you know, a lot of non-game species and songbirds and that kind of thing. Is there any way that we can include, and maybe it's not appropriate as part of, uh, as part of our initiative, uh, you know, if we're working on bobwhite quail habitat, how much that impacts non-game species and songbirds and that kind of thing? Because, I, you know, I think there's people out there that are probably non-hunters and uh, non-sportsmen that would appreciate the, uh, the work that we're uh, you know, the work that we're all working together with on bobwhite quail on, on these, you know, the impact that it has on non, positive impact that it has on non-game species. Would it be, would it be hard to include that into the uh, uh, research initiative? Just well, you know, that would be a whole additional set of objectives to do that. But just as an aside, we've already done some of that work and published a couple of papers on um, the value of bobwhites as an umbrella species for for other birds, especially declining grassland songbirds. So some of that stuff is already out there that shows that the bobwhite umbrella is very effective at hitting targets for a bunch of other high priorities um, songbird species. I'd like to see that, and maybe that might be something that we uh, promote as we as we move through this project. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Jones. Any other questions from the commissioners? Okay, at this time, if you're in the public and would like to make any comments, please step to the microphone and identify yourself and fire away with your questions. Seeing none, thank you very much, uh, Wally and Joe and Dr. Bueller, for this presentation. I know our chairman is very uh, excited about this, as well as the rest of the commission. We look forward to the continued good work for the, the bobwhite quail population. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Taylor, are you here? Okay, there you are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm going to present a couple of changes to proclamation. It's going to be 2005, which will be changed to 2105 if this is approved. And what we've done, we had a we had a couple of 
uh, one, one law that the legislature recently changed related to the carry of handguns. I'm sure most people are familiar with that. We had wording in our proclamation that, that contradicted that, so we had to go and make this change. We normally would wait until wildlife season setting to do this, but we needed to go ahead and make this change, so we put a couple of more cleanups in there that we needed. Um, the first one we did, as you'll see, if you go through your red line, you'll see the mention of sandhill cranes in addition to migratory birds, except waterfowl and sandhill cranes related to the use of non-toxic shot. And all that does is clarify that you have to use non-toxic shot with sandhill cranes, which is the way it was in the um, guide already. So we clarified those that it must be non-toxic shot for sandhill cranes. Um, if you go on down through the prohibited acts in section two, <clears throat> we're simply are gonna change the word take to the word hunt because the word hunt is defined in TCA 71101, which is the overall uh, definitions for our chapter. And it's just, it's defined in there. And if you can see on the, uh, flip down through the slides there to the next, that one right there. And if you go down to, um, I think the third, third slide will give that TCA. Move on. Right there. This is our, our, TCA has a bunch of definitions in there. This is just the one that relates to hunting. And take is not defined in our chapter, so we wanted to change that. Move to the next slide, please. And this is something the Fur Harvesters Association wanted changed. It was brought to us by Clarence Dye. And uh, apparently some people were tying their traps with uh, parachute cord as opposed to chain or cable or wire which, um, you know, I'd never seen that, but uh, they say that that had been seen several places. We're just clarifying that, which is a very minor change. I think most people are doing that. And this is the one, the last one, under miscellaneous number six, changes the wording to match the new state law on the carrying of firearms in Tennessee. So it just changed uh, our wording about people carrying on refuges, WMAs, private land, et cetera. And that's all the changes we have for that proclamation. Do I have any questions? Thank you, Commissioner Taylor. Do any commissioners on the Wildlife Committee have any questions for Colonel Taylor? Any other commissioners have any questions? Seeing none, I'll uh, entertain a motion for approval by the Wildlife Committee. Do I hear a second? second. Well, motion is second. All those on the Wildlife Committee in favor, please by signaling saying aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I recognize uh, Commissioner Jones. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, before, before we adjourn the wildlife committee i noticed that there's a whole bunch of guys with quail forever shirts sitting on the front row if anybody from quail forever is here you don't have to get up and talk just hold your hand up i just uh, wanted to recognize you for coming out and uh, and spending some time with us today during the report and um, i would encourage all the commission they invited me to a youth quail hunt uh, oh. this past this past about fall 12 now huh you about 12 now or <laughs> I didn't get to shoot, oh. but I got to watch. I got to watch and, and, and reminisce some, although the, uh, the quail flew a little bit better when I was a kid. But uh, if, if you haven't been to one of the youth quail hunts that the Quail Forever chapters across the state of Tennessee put on, I would encourage you to go one because it, you talk about a bunch of kids having a good time working behind a dog and all the things that we remember about quail hunting. It, it, is, it is a hoot and the turnouts are fantastic. So I would encourage all the all my fellow commissioners to go this fall when they uh, start sponsoring those again. Thank, thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Chairman Granberry. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Jones. I appreciate you recognizing those. I was wondering if we were going to do that. Uh, I was excited to learn about a partnership with Quail Forever and, and SGI, Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. Uh, would any of you uh, or are any of you aware of that uh, partnership?
partnership and would any of you like to uh, address that or, or uh, bring to the audience's uh, attention that uh, partnership? Okay. Well, I, I just wondered if, if you were. It, it looks to me like uh, the partnership would uh, address uh, a lot of the agency's concerns about populations, about restoring uh, natural grasslands. It would help uh, improve habitat. It would also address their concerns. Uh, and the native songbirds were mentioned and the prairie songbirds, which uh, is of their concern. So. All interested partners in, in, in the initiative would benefit, so uh, I'm excited to learn more about the partnership. Thank you. And, and Commissioner Jones, uh, thank you for your comment about the uh, event this fall, and that's a perfect entree into what Chris mentioned earlier, is to get that on that interactive calendar so everybody knows about it uh, in advance to make plans accordingly. Did you have a question, Commissioner Cox? Yeah, let me ask Wally one more quick question I just thought of. I'm sure there are other states that have studied quail and are studying quail now. Do you, do you talk to your peers in other states and find out what their studies have results and, and do, you, do you use their information or any? Well, we do have relationships. Is this on? With, with other professionals that are our peers. Um, the thing about this research project, and something I failed to mention is this, these guys' chapter um, supported this research project monetarily and provided a lot of funding for that, so we'll just recognize that with this group of guys. But, um, you know, we thought this research project was so important because we've never had this type of research done in the state of Tennessee. Um, especially on the total demographics of quail on a year-round basis. We've looked at uh, some telemetry work for nesting habitat work back in the 90s, but never a year-round study for quail in Tennessee. And other states have done that, but they're looking at different systems, whether it be a pine system in the, in the deep south or maybe uh, one of the western states. So because it's you know, we can read the research from other states on very, very similar projects, but it does not directly re relate to Tennessee, so to speak, because of the different systems that they're in. Um, so, you know, that's why we really wanted this type of research in Tennessee to be more applicable, I guess would be another way to say it. Uh, seeing no further questions, Mr. Chairman, that uh, ends the Wildlife Committee's report for today. All right, thank you, Chairman. Um, you know, this is an exciting concept. People said that this state couldn't bring wild turkeys back in the numbers that we did. They said we, they said we couldn't restore elk uh, to this part of the world, and we've done that. And I firmly believe that we can make some real progress to bring quail back and that we need to redouble our efforts to do that. And I certainly appreciate you guys from Quail Forever being here with us because uh, you're, you're such an important part of, of, of this initiative. Um, and we appreciate very much what you do. At this point, let's take a, about a five minute uh, break and we'll be back, well, let's say 10 minutes. We'll be back in 10 minutes.
All right, let's take our seats, ladies and gentlemen, and get rolling again. Let's everybody get back in here, please. <clears throat> All right, uh, for those out in the hall, we're ready to start. <laughs> I don't know how else to say this. I know. I'm like to I'm going to find Commissioner Jones. All right, so all the commissioners are back. We're back on the, the record. At this time, I want to introduce uh, Kent Woods, the chairman of the Fisheries Management Committee. Thank you, Commissioner Ripley. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call up Frank Fish uh, for his uh, hatchery update. And Frank, nothing against uh, one of your reports, but me and uh, Chairman Ripley have lost a very good friend and we've got a memorial service we got to be in Gatlinburg by 4 30 so we are going to have to skip out and leave right now but continue right. on and let's go Rimbo okay but we leave this meeting in the capable hands of my vice chairperson Angie Box thank you Angie Yeah, um, yeah, I'll start up then. So last month we, I, I gave a presentation about our, our monitoring program in the state and that's one of our important uh, objectives and another important component of fisheries management in Tennessee is our hatcheries and our stocking programs. So w one thing I, I want to go over kind of why we stock. One, one misconception that some people have is that every fish in the state has been stocked by TWRA and that's just not true. We do stock a lot of fish, but we have a, uh, we, we're really lucky to have many, many species and many water bodies where we don't need to stock to maintain quality fisheries. But, okay, so where, where do we stock and why? We do it to create fisheries, uh, like we fished this morning on the Clinch River, a lot of those fish are stocked. Uh, and on, uh, say, Melton Hills, or this picture here is on, on Boone Lake of a hybrid striped bass, all of our striped bass and and Cherokee bass, which are hybrid bass, are stocked in Tennessee. We also stock to supplement populations that are already uh, already sustained. You know, we, we have walleye in, say, Douglas, but we can add wall. We have added walleye to Douglas and made for better walleye fishing. We add crappie to some lakes that need help and where those those stockings are successful to make better crappie fishing. Another th another. Uh, projects that we'll engage in is try to restore native species or strains. Uh, we, we're working right now with walleye, uh, it, which is a, 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 we have a rock castle strain that we get out of Kentucky that we're stocking in Fort Patrick Henry. And we're using those fish to hopefully uh, to replace the, the northern strain that we're using to stock lakes right now, because these fish may have potential to spawn and, and be self-sustaining. Unfortunately, a lot of our walleye fisheries in the state require us to, to stock fish to maintain them. They, they're not self-sustaining in a lot of the reservoirs. Of course, you, you may know about the Southern Appalachian brook trout. We have a hatchery at Teleco. Part of it is dedicated to the brook trout to restore that native species. In the past, we've had lake sturgeon in our hatcheries, muskie, 
an alligator gar to re restore those species. And we also stock to change the genetics of fish. That is our Florida bass program. We stock Florida bass not to make more bass, but to make the genetics change in those populations, hopefully to have more Florida influence to grow big fish. And lastly, for special events, we can instantly create a, a, a fishing event by stocking catfish or, or a trout, which is in the middle of this image here, for, as an example for a kids' fishing event. So we do that, and we just did that last, last weekend was free fishing day. A lot of our staff were driving catfish across the state, and there were dozens and dozens of events that people partook in. So our hatcheries, we have 11 hatcheries in Tennessee. And we work closely with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to manage the, 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 the stocking out of two U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service hatcheries. In total, we're running about 8 million fish a year. And more impressive to me is the 1,500 deliveries. We not only raise the fish, but we, we deliver them all over the state on really odd schedules at times. It would be very difficult to, to hire someone to do that, and our, our staff do that. Our trout hatcheries are located, are shown on the map here. We have four. And those are the, those are the two uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service hatcheries, and I'm just showing where the, the city of Gatlinburg also stocks some trout locally in Gatlinburg. And, and we're involved in giving them fish to get them started each year to produce those. We stock a lot. We have uh, four species of trout come through our hatcheries, rainbow brown, lake trout, and brook. And by far, rainbow trout are the most commonly stocked fish. And we, we, these fish are used in all the programs that you see here, our tailwater stockings uh, below, below major hydropower dams. A large portion of the fish by number go below those dams to, to maintain those great fisheries. We also stock streams in the, in the springtime. We have a few reservoirs that will hold trout year round. And we stock winter, trout in the winter in a lot of locations to generate fishing opportunity. We're starting on a few com community fishing lakes where we're going to transition from cat fishing in the, in the summer to trout in the winter. And of course, the, I mentioned, already mentioned the southern, brook southern Appalachian brook trout. So how do we grow a trout? I, what I want to do today is just give a quick overview of like a virtual hatchery tour and then talk about some of the work that we've done to maintain the hatcheries and where we're going with that. So how do we get to have trout to stock? Well, trout come in a box to all our hatcheries. We don't, we don't maintain brood fish. We are able to get them free from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And the neat thing about it is we can get trout at different times of the year, particularly the rainbow trout, so we can have fish at different phases in our hatcheries throughout the year. Those fish come out of the box, or those eggs come out of the box, and they're put in various <laughs> styles of egg trays where, they're, where they incubate. And as they incubate, they fall through the cracks, and they go in those in those raceways that are indoors. And they'll stay indoors for weeks and months sometimes before they're big enough to go outside, to the outside raceways. This image on the left is taking the tanks out of the, the Flintfield building to run them outside. And then those fish spend up to a year plus, in some cases, in the raceways being fed daily, every day, not you know seven days a week, to grow them up to the size that we want to stock them. Those fish are harvested in the morning, always, uh, and then they are loaded on the trucks and sent all over the state. The, by far, the trout hatcheries do the most driving. They, they do a lot of trips every year to get a few hundred fish here and there and everywhere in the springtime. It, it ties up their time. And eventually, those fish find their way to people that need help catching fish. So. So let's switch gears to warm water hatcheries. We have now, what are we up to? Four, we have seven warm water hatcheries across the state. And our, our biggest is Humboldt, followed by Normandy and, and Eagle Bend just down the road here. We, we produce a lot of species relative to other states at our warm water hatcheries. Uh, walleye, crappie, and striped bass are, and, and now a largemouth, Florida largemouth are our big four that we're raising, and we also raise uh, bluegill, sauger, and s some catfish. Uh, what's interesting about how they operate those hatcheries is that they, you know, they, they, they don't just raise walleye in a, in a pond one year. They, they actually will raise walleye, and then they'll raise crappie out of that same pond. So they'll use that 
that pond twice in a year is called double cropping. Sometimes they'll triple crop to do maybe bluegill or red ear at the end of the year. Uh, the, the fish that are raised in the warm water facilities exclusively go to large reservoirs, our own fishing lakes, and occasionally community lakes if it's catfish getting stocked out. Or we're trying to help a state park get, get, get fish they need. So the, the warm water hatchery cycle is a, a lot different in that they have to go get their fish to, 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 to have brood fish to get, to get their eggs and milk from to, to make uh, fertilized eggs. So this is a picture from below Rock Island this, this, this year actually uh, collecting walleye. And they've got several fish there that are, this boat was just electrofishing minutes before he rolled up and I took this picture. So those fish are still stunned. Well, those fish go back to the hatchery and they're, they're watched closely. Some of the species have to be given uh, hormone injections to time when the eggs will release and they have to wait around the clock sometimes to get those fish at the right time to strip the eggs and, and make fertilized eggs and they'll watch those eggs in the facility for, for days until they, they'll hatch out and they may spend up to a week or so, depending on the species, they, they want, we wait for them to uh, absorb their egg sacs. Sometimes they're fed, fed like a brine shrimp or something to get them going. And then they move outside to the ponds. And these ponds are prepared, it's just not straight water. You know, they've been fertilizing these ponds, making sure there's a, a whole ecosystem for these fish to land into where they can eat and, and grow as, as young fish. And then some of the species will transition over into feed that we can throw into the ponds to grow them out to size. And then those ponds are harvested. If it's a, say, walleye, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're harvested early in the year. The, the largemouth bass were just uh, finished up stocking last week, I think. So that's done. And other species will be in there and, and not harvested until the fall, like crappie and striped bass. To harvest the pond, they'll start draining these ponds maybe two days out to get the water really low and all the fish get concentrated in what we call the kettle at the, at the base of the pond. And that's where the fish are all concentrated, gathered up, and put on the trucks. It's kind of hard to see in this image in this room, but there's, you can see the kettle, all the people working in the kettle. People are hauling them fish by bucket up to the trucks and those trucks will drive to a reservoir that day to, or, or multiple reservoirs depending on how good a haul they had out of that pond. Here's an image of them releasing fish. And hopefully, you know, if it's a crappie stocking, one day we'll see more crappie in that lake for that, for that effort. And I want to go over hatchery improvements. That's what I was thinking about in this presentation at first. I wanted to tell everyone what has been done in the last 20 years of hatchery improvements. And I'm not going to go over that in great detail. I'm just going to go over the highlights of, of what we, the kinds of things we've been doing to give you an idea of where we're at at our hatcheries. Uh, we, in early 2000s, we had an outside review of our hatcheries to tell us what things we could do and should do. And they gave us a really big price tag. But instead of doing it through uh, outside vendors, the, agents, the commission approved some funding for the agency to work off of to get the job done, $280,000 a year. At the same time, the TWA engineering crew dedicated one of their crews to just work on hatcheries at, on rotation as needed. And as recently as 2020, the, we, a lot of progress was made, and you'll see some images of that. But in 2020, we really put an extra effort to get Normandy hatchery done and get kickstarted some other things. So we requested almost $3 million, and the commission approved that last year. We're happy to have that, and we're working through that very well. Here's some examples of the kinds of work we did at, at trout hatcheries. We completely replaced the raceways at, Norman, or at uh, Flintville Hatchery, and we did a lot of waterworks, uh, what I call it. Uh, water supply lines are the lifeblood of trout hatcheries. We, we measure our production capability in, you know, how much flow we have of quality water. So we had to recapture a lot of the springs that provide water to the hatcheries over the last decade. And every hatchery had some kind of water issue that had to get fixed, and, and we did that. We also did improvements to the water itself. We added oxygen injection systems at a couple of hatcheries, and we also uh, added this, geo, this called the gas infusion injection system 
that's at Buffalo Springs Hatchery, it not only adds oxygen, but it helps to strip nitrogen out of the groundwater, which has been, our groundwater is, is, is what serves these hatcheries, and groundwater changes over time, we're learning, and we have to treat it more and more to get the quality we need out of the groundwater. So this is a pretty serious apparatus that we are renting right now to see how it works, and, and if we like it, we may be buying one at some point. Another uh, improvement we made at trout hatcheries was to install these. Are, they look like trout raceways, but they're actually sediment ponds to collect all the debris from the facility. And then we, once once they're filled, we think we're the, to where they're full. Somebody, the you know, the truck comes and sucks all that sludge out of there and takes it away. This keeps us in compliance with our discharge from the hatcheries because we otherwise would have the potential to put too much in the receiving rivers. So in summary, we had the major renovations at Flint Bill. I'd encourage you to stop by there if you haven't ever. We've installed oxygen systems, gas injection systems, the retention ponds. Well, I don't have a picture here, but if a lot of you went to the <coughs> Pelico hatchery and saw the new uh, the brook trout facility up there, it, it's it's all ready to go and, and totally renovated. And a lot of buildings got repaired over the last couple of decades. We had a, a ton of deferred maintenance on these facilities that were about to fall down and people were living in some of them. It was really a shame and they they're finally have gotten all up to code and we have people in proper residences and roofs on all the buildings. There was a lot of that kind of work that happened. So to shift gears to the warm water improvements, we pretty much focused on acreage. We needed to build more ponds to meet the demands that we, we see in the future for warm water hatcheries. It's an example of that was to have more ponds to raise Florida largemouth bass. This image kind of captures all of it. We, when you build a pond, you have to have obviously a depression. You've got to put the, the water, in, water in, inflow system in and a kettle in to collect the fish. And that image in the background is a pond liner uh, that is being installed, that, that increases the efficiency of that pond. We don't have uh, problems with the fish getting into the sediment when they go to harvest the pond and it limits uh, vegetation from growing. A lot of benefits, but it's expensive to lawn ponds, but we've, lawn ponds, we've been doing it. Here's just a few examples of some of the bigger jobs. You can't really see it very well here in this, on this screen. Oh, I can't from over here, but. So yeah, the Normandy hatchery we added 11 acres to, that, that hatchery is completely built out now. It's, it's at phase three and it, it was only, that job was just finished a few weeks ago, really. Uh, so that's, if you get a chance to go see that, it's impressive. That, that 900,000 helped push to finish that job. At Humboldt hatchery, over time, we added Annex one and two, and we've added the Florida bass facility. Here's a, uh, a picture of the Florida largemouth bass hatchery. It's not an architectural wonder or anything, but it, it does really nice, neat stuff inside. It, it has raceways inside that are heated. So in the springtime, when other when normal when our bass would are, that are in the reservoirs would not be stop, are thinking of spawning, we can put these Florida bass in there in a hot tub, so to speak, and they get, they they think it's time to spawn, and they do. And so we get these eggs early and we can get them in our, in our systems early, which is, gives us a stocking advantage over the native fish. But here's an example of a, a largemouth bass that's over a spawning mat. We put the mats in, put the fish in, they immediately congregate to those mats, spawn. We retrieve the mats with the eggs still in them and just hang them in, in smaller raceways until they hatch and then those fry come off. When those fry are, they're, they're fed brine shrimp, I think, for a while. And then they have to go to another hatchery. These fish will go to five other hatcheries within our system to be grown out before they're stocked in, in early June. And that's all part of it. So just to summarize what, what we've done recently in warm water hatcheries, uh, we've added 65% more acreage to our system, and we've lined a lot of our ponds. Uh, we've, we've added the Florida Bass Facility. Before we had that facility built and, you know, and up to speed in 2017, we had to beg and borrow from other states across the nation to get Florida Bass. And a lot of times we could only 
get them on their timeline or, or we couldn't get them. So we, this was the first year in 2017 that we were able to meet our own allocation needs at that time. So we're pretty proud of that. And we also repaired several other water lines and kettles and liners at, at other hatcheries along the way. We, we're not only working on one big project at a time, as uh, while we're at one spot, other projects, problems will pop up and we'll address them as we go. But overall, we've increased production at warm water facilities by about 2 million fish. We have that capacity. Now, we don't hit it every year. We can still have bad crops, so to speak, or bad years. But we have that capacity now, and we've been averaging it pretty well. So just lastly, I want to give you a heads up about some upcoming improvements. Uh, at, at hum this is a, a shot of um, Humboldt Hatchery. That hatchery is 64 years. This part of the hatchery is 64 years old. And really, all the pipes and ponds that you see in that image are not functioning correctly. They're filled in. They've got problems. So we want to replace all of it with that design. And that's, that's where the engineering crew and our uh, funding effort is headed next, is the Humboldt Hatchery. That'll take years to get done. And then the, after that, we're going to go to Marstown. And we, we own eight acres, well, we own land that we can put eight acres of ponds on there, just <coughs> downhill of the existing ponds, kind of in there. So those are two upcoming projects that we're excited about. And I, I also want to mention something about the hatcheries that, um, you know, it, it early in, in 2020, when we were in, the, all of us were in the throes of COVID, what can we do, what can't we do? How are we going to get our jobs done? This, that was the peak time for hatchery employees to do their thing. They had to get all these fish spawned, moved around, cared for, and they adapted and figured all that out and got, got the job done. So they were some of our most essential employees in, uh, in fisheries, and I want to give them thanks for getting the job well done. So with that, I'll take any questions about hatcheries again. I just wanted to give you a broad overview, not hammer you with every project that we did in 20 years. All right, any questions for discussion? Commissioner Butt? Uh, Chief, I'd like to thank you for uh, the management that, and, uh, that you lend to th that particular aspect of the agency. Outstanding job, staying on top with the, with the support of, of all the employees. And I think you're doing an outstanding job, and I just want to thank you for that. Thank you, sir. Frank, um, do you still buy fish? We do. We buy catfish, uh, about $100,000 worth, about 35,000 pounds. Uh, catfish are hard for, on our hatcheries because they have to be in our hatcheries for over a year on our warm water hatcheries. And as you saw, they kind of cycle annually. But yes, we do. We buy those fish. There's a, used to, you, you, we, we didn't like to buy fish because you didn't know about the genetics. Do you have sources for, for, for other, for crappie or Florida bass or whatever that you like the genetics that, that that's an option and, and do, is buying fish more uh, cost efficient than expanding hatcheries or adding, I know it's more cost efficient than adding hatcheries, but is it as cost efficient as, as raising the fish ourselves? It a lot of the fish that we raise, like just walleye, crappie, no, there is no market where we can go buy them. Florida largemouth bass would be a good example of one we could buy and I guess have bought in real small numbers early on. And I know that we just bought the F1s from uh, American Sport Fish out of Alabama to stock Boone Lakes, but that's not a typical thing that we do. Uh, they're, you know, I don't know that we could say, say if we turned around and tried to replace all of our, our Florida stocking with bought fish, it would be very expensive. Those fish are half a buck a piece to stock. Uh, and yet the real hang up I always had, and we, we've talked about this topic a lot in the past, the, is the flexibility and ability to get fish stocked where you want them, when you want them. And that, that, that really drives those 1,500 trips that we, that we deliver on every year are a big part of it. It's not just the production. It's getting those fish where they need to be, when they need to be. 
that, that said, I mean, we, we probably do need to look into that more for specialty jobs, like for, with this F1 stocking that we did, for those of you who don't know, it's the Florida and largemouth bass F1 hybrid. We bought those fish because as I showed you, the, that massive Florida bass facility was driving on just Florida bass. And we were putting out, uh, we were trying to raise, a, a produce a million eggs, and we did. If we had tried to raise 50,000 F1s while we were trying to raise a million of these others, it would be the equivalent of stopping the production line to make a custom item. So we didn't want to do that. So in those cases, it's kind of interesting to look into that. So I, I, I don't see any easy shortcuts for buying our, a, a lot of these things. It, it may be for the odd event where we needed to supplement a trout or a catfish right now. That seems to be the easiest market that's there to consider. But even when we do that and have done that in the past, the challenge was always getting them to be willing to do multiple sites. Even when we buy these catfish right now, they don't deliver them to the dozens and dozens of sites. They drop them at one of our hatcheries, and those people that are there already help get help from uh, you know the regional biologists, and they drive them all over to do that last mile, so to speak. Do you change the genetics of the, the F1 where you get the, the brood fish? every so often so you don't have the same genetics? Well, we, it, the, the, for the Florida bass facility, we, we have a brood, like a pedigree stock of Florida bass that we care for and, they, and spend money to feed. All, they they got to be fed all year long. Those fish are four, five, I think, they've got multiple uh, mature age classes that are in-house, so to speak. We actually keep one set of those fish at Eagle Bend in a protected area, and then we have the other half of them at Humboldt, so we don't lose our lot. So yeah, we know everything about those in, to the individual, what their genetics are, and we, we use them to make sure we have Floridas with Floridas to make Floridas. And over time, we will interject more fish into that. And we, we get those kinds of fish from trades with other states. And, we, and we, we, have, we have the ability and a pretty good network to trade with other states for different species and do on a regular basis. I'm going to take just a second. Um, back in 2005, I think, or six, there was that money that was allocated for, for hatchery improvements, and Commissioner Mike Chase was the first commissioner in some time that was really focused on fishermen and fishing. And we were in a meeting discussing our hatcheries and how bad a shape they were in, and like you said earlier, and Commissioner Chase was new and he hadn't said much and he sat up and he blistered the agency that we send more money to Ducks Unlimited in Canada than we spend on our own hatcheries. And from that point on, the hatcheries were, got a lot of focus. So good for him. Thank you. Chair. I'm sorry. Commissioner Blue. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Frank, I was going to ask you, I know recently uh, Benton County Chamber of Commerce and Henry County Chamber of Commerce had that joint project and they released, uh, I guess, some Florida bass as well. Uh, what, what exactly is TWRA's involvement in that? And could you explain any of that? I'm not real familiar with it. Sure. I'll, I'll back up a little bit. Kentucky Lake is one of our lakes that where we're since 2015 stocking with Florida bass. So we had been stocking Kentucky Lake uh, as well as four other reservoirs with Kentucky bass annually. And uh, lo local citizens in, the in those counties wanted to add fish to our stocking. And I, I, I get the sense that they think that they're adding fish to the lake, which they are, but they're really adding genetics, probably not increasing the number of bass. And I've, we've, we've told them as much in many instances, but they, there's a little kind of a dual thinking of what's really happening there. But we, we know that they're buying fish from the same facility that we bought our F1s from at North American uh, Hatchery, or, no, American Sportsman Hatchery in Alabama. And we, we do trust their genetics. So they're, they're buying pure Floridas and they've added, the first year they added 100 
and 50,000 fish. Next year, they've, they've collected money from other counties on the lake to buy even more fish. And they, this year, I think they topped out at 350,000 that they are adding to our 150,000. And I don't think it's gonna hurt, it's certainly not gonna hurt our project, but it's, we, we still have the same goal and we're still gonna have some number of F1s that can be produced in Kentucky Lake. By adding a lot more fish quicker, we may get there a little quicker, but we may not have as much time to enjoy it because they might get there and get beyond it faster. Because this, this F1 hybrid uh, management that we're doing through Florida bass stocking where they breed with native stocks, you can only do that once as a population. You can't, you can only go through that F1 glory years one time. So by them adding those fish, we may get there a little sooner, but we're not going to get anywhere different. So I appreciate their help. If we had a year where we, we had a complete failure at the hatchery and we couldn't go to Kentucky Lake, they would have been really helpful to, to stock for us. But them adding fish is, you know, I, I think it's, it's changing the rate at which that project is happening, not the outcome. That's, that's my opinion. And we've told them that going in, but there, there, there could be a year when stocking fingerlings really works to add numbers of bass. And I hope that's the case but that's not what we see in the signs over and over again. Yes, sir, Commissioner Butts. So our emphasis or focus on releasing the F1, which is the first cross, which supposedly is supposed to increase the most heterosis. So what's the, what are we hoping to accomplish with that F1 release on the native population? The, when we, when we stock a pure Florida into a, a, a northern population, we're expecting to get the benefit of having a lot of offspring, way more fish than we could ever stock, generated in the wild with native fish and, our, and these Florida bass once the few of them that survive mature. In contrast, when we stock F1s, we're saying, we don't, in the case of Boone, it's a small system, it's a tributary impoundment, which means that the water level goes up and down a lot. Historically, those impoundments have not responded well to Florida bass stocking. So when we had an opportunity to take advantage of the vegetation at Boone, which we had this year, it made sense to jump right to the F1. And the F1, from what we've observed on Chickamauga, is growing faster than a native fish. The Florida bass we never hardly see again because they don't do that well. They, they, they get big enough to spawn, obviously, but we, we, the big fish that are being brought in, in in tournaments are predominantly F1s, not the Floridas. So we are after that vigor of that F1. It, it, may, it may come that, and in that sense, when we're putting these F1s in Boone, we're hoping that we're adding fish on top of the population, which I was just saying is very hard to do, but it, this is a great opportunity to try it while we have all that cover. That, that's why Boone, it was a really unique time and place to do that. So that's what you would expect from the F1, the increased growth. <clears throat> but to Commissioner Cox's statement or question, is it more uh, economic to buy those F1 or are we exploring the possibility of, of producing some F1s on our own? It, it's actually, if we needed a lot of F1s on our own, we would probably convert our existing Florida system into an F1 system. But right now, in the, in the four lakes that we are in a project on stocking Floridas, we are taking advantage of the really cheap way to make F1s, which is to have, them, have it done in the wild where you stock Floridas and they spawn with native fish and you get way more fish than we could ever produce at a hatchery. So it's still cheap to do it that way until we reach a point where the genetics in that population has so much, uh, it's, you can't make, uh, like, you can't get the genetics to clean 50-50. You can have a lot of Florida in a fish, but it's not, it's not, it, it's not what you're looking for in a clean 50-50 meat at each gene. So we're watching the genetics. There, there could come a time on a place like Chickamauga where we've worked for 20 years where we can keep adding Florida bass, but there's no native fish to, for them to spawn with. 
And at that point, we have to decide, what do we do? Do we shift to all Floridas do we, or F1s, or do we, or do we just watch this experiment continue? Remember, Chickamauga is, is 10, what, 10 years ahead of, of the other lakes, so we're, we're eager to see where it goes and that we're going to use that as a roadmap to sustain this, this thriving F1 thing going on on these other lakes as long as possible, but it, it can't go on forever. Uh, it, as it can, one, one of these lakes that has a lot of Florida in it can never make that 50-50 again. It can only have a, a lake that, ha it, it can only have fish that have a lot of Florida in it or a little Florida in it, but it's not, I'm looking, I'm looking for the term, it's the heterozygosity you're looking at at each of those alleles is what matters. And that's why we have the geneticists to tell us where we're at on that rate. And right now we can still, we're still making some F1s uh, and hopefully we're making a lot of them on, on the new lakes like Kentucky, Watts Bar, Nick Jack, where, where we're stocking. So. Okay. Are, are, are we equipped to monitor <clears throat> the benefit of the F1 growth? Uh, yes. The hybrid uh, vigor or the heterosis and the ones that we release? Yes, we will. What, what we intend to do is the, the, one of the really cheap ways of doing it is to wait five years or so and see how, how the, the fishermen bring in fish. They all, always bring in big fish. You just take a fin clip from all the big fish at a tournament, and if you, know, you have a disproportionate number of those F1s than you would expect otherwise, and we, then we'll know we've done something there. So then and that's, we, the we nice can, thing is yeah. the genetics cost has gone way down, and there's, there's even, not, even less lethal or less invasive ways of doing it. You can do it with a with a slime swipe now too. So, so we can identify the makeup or the genetics of those by just. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll be able to take snapshots of that Boone fishery over the next, for as long, well, another the life of those fish as much as we want to look at them. And we're looking at the, the, the rest of the river fish as well on like a five to seven year window to see how they're, they're coming along. We don't expect, I, I mean, I, I don't expect to have exactly the same performance out of every reservoir like we did at Chickamauga. There's gonna be some, maybe some better, some worse, but that's, that's why we do the assessments. All right, thank you. That'll make Commissioner Woods happy, I'm sure. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. I, I just have one, Frank. Uh, sure. How many fish do you catch this morning? Uh, I, I caught no fish today, except when I had the electric fisher to show off the, uh, the wild rainbow trout of the Clinch River, which is really exciting for me to see after a career working on trout, to see a river that didn't produce fish is now producing fish. So that's a great report to make. So. That's your fault. They didn't catch any fish. Just kidding. All right. No more questions. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate Thank you. your presentation. All right, I'm going to call on Chairman Bill Cox with uh, Budget Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is a two page in your book or on your pad uh, financial statement uh, for the agency, and I'm reporting through the month of April, July of last year through April. 21. And at the top of the first slide is the boating fund. Uh, <clears throat> registration income is approximately a million dollars more than the projected amount for the year, which is about a 27 percent increase. Uh, the expense uh, of the budget to date for the, of, of the year is approximately 44 percent. The next slide, uh, the wildlife fund, the uh, license income is uh, just shy of $6 million increase over projection, which is about a 19% increase uh, for the year. And the expense uh, through April for the year is approximately 64% of the allotment. On the next slide, the wetlands fund, wetlands acquisition fund has a, a approximate balance of 16.5 million and the last slide, which is our uh, uh, invested funds, uh, the uh, rate 
uh, year-to-date rate is uh, approximately 2.24 percent less than what we uh, began with at the first of the year. Uh, and while our SPIF funds, which is the state pool investment funds, is currently earning 0.02 percent. Thank you, Ken. Any questions? That's all we have, Madam Chairman. Thank you, sir. Call on Chairman Brian McLaren with audit. The audit committee asks for uh, Deputy Director Chris Richardson to give us the audit report, please. Thank you, Chairman McLaren, and uh, excited to be here to talk about audit today. One of the uh, subjects that I've been drinking out of a fire hose for the last couple of weeks. I, you'll see on uh, on this presentation, and, and I'll preface this by saying this is not going to, this is not really a true audit report of of the findings of the auditor. Um, our auditor, Ms. Barbara Reagan, has moved on to, to bigger and better things. We're very disappointed to lose her, uh, but we have a vacant audit position that certainly one of my first priorities will be to get that filled so that uh, someone more qualified than me can stand here and talk to you about all things audit. Me being here to talk to you about audit is a lot like an attorney talking to you about wildlife or fisheries related things, and you know, that's never a good idea. So. Um, what I'm going to do today is kind of give you an overview of the role of the internal auditor, how the internal auditor functions uh, with the executive director, how that internal auditor uh, functions within state government with the executive internal auditor, which you'll see both those terms through this presentation. The internal auditor is the person that is situated within our agency. The executive internal auditor uh, is an external employee that works at the pleasure of the governor that helps coordinate some of the internal audit functions. Uh, so this is kind of an overview of the content of the agenda, and I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. Uh, these are the principles of internal audit, which our internal auditor abides by. These are I, I, a principles that is the Institute of Internal Auditors. Uh, there was legislation that dictated that some of these principles be adopted by all of the internal auditors and there's something called the Red Book Standards that they follow. Uh, first thing we have is the Internal Audit Charter which we are in the process of, of, of updating and making sure that we're um, following the protocols of the new, uh, new statutes and rules. It provides a blueprint for the organization and on how the audit will function. It also provides the auditor the necessary authority to achieve some of the tasks and it serves as a reference point uh, to measure the effectiveness of the internal audit activity. The keys to success uh, or the key selections, excuse me, of the internal audit charter as you can see here on the screen, uh, these are all the things that we want to make sure the internal auditor our role is in the director's office is to make sure the internal auditor is given both the support and access needed uh, to help the different divisions and different parts of the agency uh, perform the audits and find where we can improve what we're doing well, what we need to, to work on. The executive director and the executive internal auditor have kind of some overlapping duties here when it comes to internal audit functions. Both will look at and approve the charter. They will improve the internal audit plan, which we, we now have an updated audit plan for 22 that uh, Ms. Barbara Reagan was, was kind enough to finish before she departed. So we're, we're ready to move forward with that for, for fiscal year 22. They also re received the communication from the internal auditor. They approved the decision making on, and removal of the internal auditor. So d while Director Wilson has the hiring authority for that position that rests with, within our agency, it's done so in co consultation with that EIA again that serves at the pleasure of the governor. Uh, this is kind of the authority that the internal auditor has uh, that we want her to have, him or her, uh, whoever will be our new one. Uh, this is kind of the standards that will help them be able to, for all the divisions to kind of realize that the internal auditor is not here to get someone in trouble or to find, you know, uh, errors and omissions to, to create disciplinary actions, but it's rather it's to help us identify areas that we need to focus on. So when we get to a point where there is an external audit, uh, we're prepared and, and hopefully without findings. This is kind of the duties and functions of the internal auditor. 
um, unrestricted access to uh, what they need to perform their functions. They remain free from all conditions that threaten the internal auditor's ability to carry out those responsibilities. And they can't have any direct control or operational responsibilities with, it, with regard to any program that they're auditing. Again, these are all standards that are set forth uh, in the, the IAA Red Book um, and also um, in those code of ethics and conduct that they are obligated to follow. These are some th situations uh, that the internal auditor not only reports to senior management in the director's office and to uh, the audit committee function of the commission, but they also report to the executive internal auditor regarding any of these types of things. So this is kind of a checks and balances. Um, certainly we've not had any issues with this in the past, but these are things that if the auditor, internal auditor feels uh, that they're being unduly restricted from something uh, or there are issues that are uncovered, uh, the internal auditor that works for the agency has the statutory duty to notify that external auditor uh, or executive internal auditor of any issues that are uncovered. Our internal auditor also is required to go through a peer review or an, or an external quality assessment. Uh, and Ms. Ms. Barbara Bragan went through one with uh, the executive internal auditor. These are the scales that the IAA uses. Uh, as you can see, 39 out of 52 ratings, uh, we were generally conforms, which is the highest. Uh, the partially conforms are do not conform. You can see there 13 out of 52 ratings. Here's an explanation of those uh, different ratings. Uh, I'm, uh, in my estimation and looking at the do not conform uh, sections that were on here, most things were issues that we were not either not aware of or that we needed to adapt to. Uh, there is no evidence uh, that I've been made aware of or that's been brought to my attention of any waste, fraud, or abuse with regard to any of the audits that have been performed. This is the public chapter that created the exec executive internal auditor. I put this on there for, for really everyone's edification. I didn't realize that, that something had changed as substantially as it did. And in fact, this public chapter goes all the way back to 2016. But generally speaking, most of the audit functions around state departments uh, were done by the comptroller's office up until this executive uh, internal auditor position was created. Now a lot of the functions of internal audit um, are being utilized to kind of uh, mitigate or lessen the burden on the comptroller's office for, for performing those so many external audits. These are some of the authorities and powers of the exe executive internal auditor. That's really basic overview of how that function works. I can tell you the audit plan for 2022 uh, based on some risk assessments and some audits that have recently been performed. Uh, the covert op bank account, the crop lease reviews, licensing, payment cards, and sub-recipient sub monitoring will all be part of the audit plan for 2022, along with the, the equipment reviews that are done every year. Uh, so with that explanation of the internal audit functions and with uh, assurances that we will be hiring an auditor just as quickly as we can get one uh, back employed, I'll be happy to answer any questions that I can. Any questions? Commissioner Butts? Can you confirm, I have two, two parts to this question, can you confirm that the deficiencies that were exposed in the previous audit uh, have been addressed? And I have a question as to the frequency of a forensic audit. Forensic audit, sir? Yeah, that we're required to have. Uh, Commissioner, but I must apologize with regard to any questions. Uh, the forensic audit, I'm unfamiliar with, with really the term or what you're referring to there. As far as the findings here that I, that I referenced, these are more uh, the internal review of our auditor and the audit functions that were performed rather than the findings that might have been uh, about the, the programmatic findings that might have come through the audit. Um, I have not reviewed or seen the final, finalized audit reports for 21 at this point. I expect to review those very soon. Uh, I can tell you I asked, uh, were there any evidence of waste, fraud, or abuse found? The answer was no. There's oversights, there's technical errors, there's transcription <coughs> errors, things that you would expect to find 
uh, as you do these audits to help get better at some of the process. Uh, but I'm unaware of any substantial fraud or abuse findings. Yeah, and, and that was my finding, and I appreciate your comments to that effect. <clears throat> Forensic audit usually means in transfer of management or uh, director in that case or something, then if there's any question, then from an agency standpoint or, or an entity standpoint that they go in and confirm all of that so there's no questions about what's been done in the past. I certainly expect to learn a lot more about these functions and, and I'm excited to, uh, to work with whoever the new auditor is going to be because I think perhaps we have underutilized this tool of internal audit and, and I think uh, we probably have perhaps also not uh, provided our internal auditor with the appropriate support to help the divisions and, and the, the folks being audited understand why we're doing it and why it's helpful. Uh, and, and in many cases, I think we have treated things like an external audit, which I hope to correct in the future. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you, Deputy Director. Thank you. Chairman Box. Thank you, Chairman McLaren. Are there any more discussions or questions? Uh, I'd like to ask you all to keep uh, Chairman Ripley and Commissioner Woods in your prayers and the family that they're friends. So appreciate that. And uh, we will, full commission will convene, reconvene tomorrow at 9 a.m. And director, any announcements? Okay, motion to adjourn. Oh. That was fun. Can I do that again? <laughs>